Today's journey finds us on a random island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The French collectivity or territory of New Caledonia has a flag carrier known as Air Caledonia International, or better known as Air Calen. I'll mention early on that French pronunciation is not my strong suit, so bear with me and try not to bully me too much in the comments for anything I pronounce wrong. I promise I'm trying my best. In addition, I'll mention that y'all will want to hang out because towards the end I'll be addressing how this may just be the best value flight I've ever seen in my life. Anywho, Air Callan finds its main hub at La Tantauta International Airport, roughly 20 miles outside the capital city of Noumea. The airline serves a handful of airports in Asia, Oceania, and the South Pacific despite only having a fleet of six aircraft. The airline is 99% government owned, specifically by the New Caledonia government, which does operate under France's umbrella. Founded in 1983, they began with aircraft leased from Air Nauru and Qantas, before rebranding from Air Caledonia International to Air Callan officially. In 2000, they began their first long haul service to Osaka, Japan with an A310 leased from Swissair. Proving worth the investment, in 2001, they purchased two A330 200s, set to be delivered at the end of their lease term of their sole A310. Once those A330s were delivered in 2003, Air Callan took over the Air France route from Tokyo to Noumea before switching to an all Airbus fleet after purchasing A320s in 2004. In 2014, the Air Callan logo and livery as we know it was born. Shortly after that, the biggest benchmark in recent times, they ordered two A320 Neos to replace their two A320COs, and two A330 Neos to replace their two A330 200s. The first A330 Neo was delivered in 2019, and despite being grounded for a short while due to what was described as a smelly cabin with fumes in flight, it seems to be a worthy investment for them. Going into COVID, Air Callan was seeing steadily increasing revenue, but since New Caledonia is almost entirely vacation travelers, they saw a 93% drop in passengers due to the pandemic, only running France mainland repatriation flights. While not officially in an alliance, Air Callan has partnerships with airlines like Air France, Air Tahiti Nui, Air New Zealand, and Qantas, Japan Airlines, and Vanuatu, as they rely heavily on international passengers connecting in their other destinations. Now let's get to the main part of this video. Welcome to the La Tantauta International Airport, one of two airports serving the Noumea capital area of New Caledonia. The first airport being the Noumea Magenta Airport, located right in the city of Noumea and serving only domestic flights using Air Caledonia's ATRs. This airport, the La Tantauta International Airport, is roughly 20 to 25 miles outside of Noumea and houses all of the international flights. It was originally constructed as a U.S. military field in World War II, then converted to commercial use in the later half of the 20th century. The airport isn't too busy seeing only 3 to 8 flights per day depending on the day of the week, therefore needing only 5 gates, 3 accessible by air stairs and 2 with jet bridges. The airport went through a renovation completed in 2012 which doubled the footprint of the terminal and added 2 more gates, the first 2 with jet bridges, bringing the total gate count to 5. The airport only sees about 500,000 passengers annually, which actually only puts it slightly above the Noumea Magenta Airport. An interesting stat considering one airport sees wide bodies and international flights, the other one only sees ATRs serving a small handful of domestic destinations. I arrived a bit early, but didn't really have much of a choice because the 1am flight was too long after the hotel checkouts and stuff. The only problem is that most things were closed at this hour, most importantly the check-in and security. So I grabbed a seat in the main lobby of the terminal and got some work done while I waited for the sun to set and check-in to open. The only thing standing in my way was the lights going out for a few hours and the mosquitoes that kept biting me. And while I know they do have code share, I did find it a little funny seeing the Air France signage around the airport. I couldn't find any posting about when check-in opened, but about four hours before departure, the first employees showed up and started setting up the signs, computers, and tags. Three hours before departure, they all took their stand, and at least at the moment, I was the only business class passenger checking in, so the process did move fast at least. With bags checked and boarding pass in hand, it was now off to security, only that it was still closed, so a queue began to form. 
While in the queue, the shops and restaurant began to open, so while I waited for security to open, I took a stroll around the terminal to see the main souvenir shop, much larger than most souvenir shops and airports, and with some great local touches. Next to that is the restaurant. It looks like it has some fairly good options, including a full gelato bar. Around the corner was a fridge of pre-made options and a menu to order food or drinks across from the loads of tables. Now that everything was opened, we could really get a look at the terminal in its entirety. Not with shutters and lights out, but as it's meant to be seen by passengers. So I guess the lesson learned is that any more than three hours early and you'll be sitting around waiting for the action. One of my favorite little touches was these gardens with signs about the local flora. By this time, security was open and we passed through and onto the terminal. With two security lanes and immigration desks, it took a matter of one or two minutes to be through all that and onto the terminal, where across this little clear bridge with a view of the check-in areas, we reached the gates and the shops. The main shop is the large duty-free shop which spanned the entire walkway. Around the corner from that is the gates without check bridges. These ones house plenty of seats and then passengers are taken outside to board by stairs up to the aircraft. Our gates, however, are back before the duty free store where there's a path to the terminal edition with the jet bridges. It seems like they're trying to use these gates as much as possible and then tow aircraft over to the other stands while they sit for a while. Over here we see a restaurant, it's the same one as in the check in area so it has the same gelato bar, gotta love that. Across from that is a souvenir shop. Once again, it's the same shop as the one pre-security, although a bit smaller. As mentioned previously, there are two gates here, both with jet bridges. I also must say that I kind of love the cozy feel of this terminal. From the rounded walls to the blue accent lighting, although the curved edges were admittedly trippy when walking towards it. It did offer us possibly the best view of our airplane, however. That one not being ours, but the one right next door, still partially obstructed by Jetbridge. Back near the duty free shop, next to the restaurant however, we find the entrance to Air Callan's Hibiscus Lounge, accessible by the elevator here. Out the elevator and around the corner is the entrance to the somewhat small, but definitely enjoyable lounge. Welcome to what might be the coziest lounge I have ever been into. Keep in mind, there's rarely more than one to two flights at a time, so they don't need a ton of space. And the space they do have, I think, is used wonderfully with comfortable seating and a few little sections. I must say that this lounge might be extra cozy at nighttime. There's just something about it being dark, so the blue mood lighting is the only light source that just makes the place feel warm. Seating is found in a few setups. First is the groupings of chairs around tables. We also see couches around tables, which were the best setup for groups traveling together. Lastly was the single seats. There were a couple high stools near the food, but mostly just these chairs along the window, where I choose to sit. These seats have chargers at every few seats, and these little tabs sticking out to hold the food items that you've got. The only issue I have with it is that there's two window panes between you and the ramp, and there's those big metal structures along the window, so the ramp views are definitely obscured. The buffet is in the back, and they've got some stools for people wanting a better table for their food. First off, what you'll find is a shelf of snacks, teas, and cup of noodles, which were definitely calling my name. Then was the coffee machine, also with hot water for tea or noodles. Next to that is the main food selections. You'll see that there isn't anything too big, no big meals, but we do have plenty of little bites, sweet and savory options from finger sandwiches and wraps to cream puffs, donuts, waffles, and macarons. Above that was the assortment of alcohols making up a self-serve bar, and if you wanted something besides spirits, there was also some wines as well. Next to that being the fridge of soft drinks. First things first, I had to get myself my cup of noodles with some hot sauce and it hit the spot. Although I wanted to try some of the other food, I got my selection of sweet and savory options as well as some sauce for the lumpia type food. From here I enjoyed the view of the A330neo being unloaded from Singapore and watching them prep the gate below for our departure. The one drawback to this lounge is there aren't any restrooms in the lounge. They are right outside, however, so it is fairly simple to go in and out if you need to use it. 
I also realized that after the fact there was a shower in one of the stalls in the restroom. Didn't see any amenities so I'm not sure if they had stuff on a request or if you had to bring your own stuff, but I just didn't realize it until right before boarding, so we didn't get to use that today. Speaking of which, downstairs it was time for boarding. They were calling pre-boarding and then general boarding from the back of the aircraft to the front. Business class passengers could board at any time through a separate lane to the side. The only issue is that it wasn't marked that well, so I got a bit caught up in the normal line and ended up boarding after a bunch of other people. After joining the herd down the jet bridge, I was still one of the first people in the business class cabin. Speaking of that cabin, I am so glad I'm here at nighttime simply because of the lighting and colors in this cabin. The bluish purpley mood lighting is not too strong so that it allows us to enjoy the natural colors of this cabin as well. Speaking of which, since they chose lighter colors, it makes the cabin feel extra warm and bright and it absorbs more of the mood lighting. While I stop pretending that I have an eye for interior design, I'll show you my seat, seat 7A. It's actually the same exact seat as Air Senegal's A330 Neo, so go check that video out if you haven't seen it from last year. Regardless, you'll want an odd numbered seat on these configurations so the counter gives you extra privacy. The even numbered seats are much more exposed to the aisle. The headrest is small but plenty adjustable to stay comfortable. The seat itself is pretty wide, I just found it fairly hard. The armrest is small but mighty. It doesn't move though so it's right next to you at bedtime. You've got two windows in this seat. One of the reasons to choose the odd numbered rows is so that you're closer to the window and therefore have an easier time taking in the views. In front is the TV which was very reflective but it was touchscreen. The tray table actually slides out from below the TV. On Air Senegal the table got much more stuck. This one came out quite easily though. Below that is the footwell. These ones are crazy deep, which is nice, I just don't like the literature pocket on the wall since I usually stuff it full of chargers and stuff, but in this setup, that makes it restrict your lateral legroom quite a bit. The little flap on the leg rest helps you access the storage below it, which is pretty small, but plenty of space for your shoes. Up next to the TV is a coat hook for things you want to keep at your seat. The rest of the seat back in front is pretty empty, but you'll see how much more privacy we have as compared to that even numbered seat. Between me and the aisle is the countertop full of fun stuff. First off is the remote control that we've seen on a few aircraft with a touchpad instead of a bunch of buttons. I kind of love it. There's a swivelable reading light with a strap to lock in the headphones on it as well. Below that is the headset jack for the supplied headset. And the only storage on this side table is this little enclosed cubby. I really like having it, I just wish it were maybe a bit bigger, but it did fit the amenity kit and a phone charger before being essentially full. Adjacent to that is the cup holder which had water bottles waiting for us upon boarding. The counter itself isn't huge, but it's enough space to get some work done while you're eating. The seat controls are on this little touchscreen panel on the side of the counter. I appreciate the concept, but I hit them by accident twice and made myself jump. Lastly, the charging port is down by my right ankle and features a USB and universal charging port. Unfortunately, there were no overhead air vents, but I do appreciate when they get rid of the middle overhead bins as the cabin immediately feels twice as spacious. Amenity wise, as mentioned, first off is that water bottle that every passenger got at their seat. Next were the slippers that were sitting on the footrest at each seat once we got on board. The headphones are my all-time most comfortable headphones tied with SAS considering they're the same ones. I promptly stored them away using the clip above the reading light. The pre-departure beverage I chose was this thing that I'm going to guess was a hibiscus sparkling wine but I also could be 110% wrong on that. As for the bedding, the pillow was a nice size, slightly smaller than a normal bed pillow but also plenty firm. The comforter wasn't the thickest or warmest but good enough for our flight today. Then was the amenity kit itself. The bag was a bit flimsy of a material but had a nice design to it. The contents of it included some of the basics like a dental kit, eye mask, and earplugs. I also welcomed the headset ear covers, socks, tissues, cotton pads, and a garment bag for shoes. Also included was the lip balm, hand cream, and face cream from Peo. As we taxi for departure from the single runway island airport, at the current time Air Callan is serving 12 destinations with 6 aircraft. Interestingly enough, Air Callan maintains one of the world's youngest fleets with an average age of 3.7 years. 
one A320neo was delivered as recently as the final week of 2023. This number does exclude the two twin otters they have, each one almost 50 years old. The best part of a fleet this young is that it contributes to their push towards sustainability. These new airplanes work better with sustainable aviation fuel and are much more efficient. Their goal being to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, similar to Delta and United Airlines. As far as their destinations, the country with the most destinations is Australia, where we see service to Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. In the South Pacific, we see their hub of Noumea, but also Nadi, Fiji, Auckland, New Zealand, Wallace and Vele of Wallace and Fortuna, Port Vila, Vanuatu, and Papiete, Tahiti, French Polynesia, which is also their only domestic destination. We also see two Asian destinations in Singapore, Changi, and Tokyo, Narita, where we're heading today. Formerly, we've seen Osaka, Japan, their first international destination, Seoul, South Korea, and Hangzhou, China. Australia and New Zealand remain their most popular destination with markets for tourism, exports, and business. Each of the destinations there seeing three times weekly service besides Sydney, served four times weekly. Sydney is also the only destination with the larger A330neo during peak times. Singapore and Tokyo are largely where we see the A330neo even though these destinations see much less point-to-point -point traffic. These destinations serve largely as launch points for people trying to get from mainland France to or from New Caledonia due to connections with partner airlines. This strategy has proven so successful that Singapore even sees six times weekly service now, making it their most frequent destination. All of these routes, as well as their future plans, require a strategic utilization of aircraft, but we'll get onto the fleet and future a bit later on. In the air, first off, we want to take a look through the menu that was passed out to the business class passengers. The first page was a welcome letter, but there was also this little insert with the wine list on it. After that came the food options. I wouldn't exactly call it two meals, but we were given a snack and a breakfast selection. After that, it was given to us in Japanese, and then the list of the beverages. And while they prepare our food, let's take a look through the in-flight entertainment options on board Air Catalan's seatback TVs. Starting off with the movies, you can see there were 52 total titles. We can sort by language, and when doing that, we see it drop to 42 English options. Looking through them, there wasn't exactly the normal classics. I'd say there was a few movies that I wanted to watch, and the rest were things that I watched because there was really nothing else available. I did, however, enjoy the privilege of being able to add things to your list of favorites for the music and the movies. Then the TV show options, where we see 35 selections. We can also sort by language and drops it to 27 English options.
keep in mind that's 27 episodes, not 27 different titles. As you see here, there's four different comedy shows, each one with only one or two episodes available. The music was by far the most diverse, with 85 different albums, all full of different songs. In addition, they also had the New Caledonia songs. Kind of cool listening to what the people on the islands like to enjoy. I definitely enjoyed the external camera, although at nighttime it was pretty much pitch black for most of the flight. They also had a quick survey that we could take before getting off the airplane. Then was the duty free information. There was a video about the duty free services as well as the duty free catalog, including all kinds of things, including the Air Callan model aircraft, which I almost purchased. Then was the kids section with movies, TV shows, games, and music specifically geared towards kids. There was also a section describing the Wi Fi on board Air Callan, which we will take a little bit of a look at shortly. There was also a large section of videos just about Air Callan, their services, their loyalty program, all that kind of stuff, including things like their in-flight magazine that we find in the seat back pocket. Then there was an entire section of videos and brochures just about New Caledonia, so if you were flying to New Caledonia for the first time, you could learn all about this beautiful place. They also had descriptions of a bunch of their other destinations that you could read about, including some that they don't currently fly to, like Bangkok and Los Angeles of all places. Then was the map, and I was a bit nervous because on these A330s a lot of times the map isn't exactly adjustable, it just kind of auto plays a series of zooms and flight information. To my surprise, however, this one was fully adjustable, kind of like using your cell phone. You could move the map with your fingers, you could pinch to zoom in or out, and there was a ton of different preset views that you could access as well. Playing through the in-flight entertainment system, one of my favorite parts is this touchpad. You can move the little cursor around the TV and click to select things, which was great when you were in your bed mode. Now for Air Callan's Wi-Fi on board. They didn't have full flight Wi-Fi available on this flight, however, they did have Wi-Fi available in different packages of certain megabits that could be paused and resumed throughout the flight. Perhaps the best part is if you were traveling in the business class cabin, you got a 250 megabits Wi-Fi package completely for free. All you had to do was enter your ticket number and email and you were good to go. Testing the speed of the videos, this is not exactly going to play any YouTube videos, but it was plenty just for browsing on your phone. While watching TV, it was almost time for our meal service, which began with a hot towel. Because we departed just after midnight, it wasn't exactly a dinner service, more of what they called a snack service, but it came with a platter full of cold mixed veggies and meats. Alongside that was a selection of French cheeses. We also were given a fresh fruit skewer and a seasonal side salad. The flight attendant also talked me into one of her favorite onboard wines and I've got to say even as someone who doesn't typically enjoy wine, it was pretty good. I also enjoyed not only the Air Callan branding on the silverware, but these fun little tiki salt and pepper shakers. We had a little under 8 hours to go before our arrival into Tokyo. I had wrapped up my dinner and I was super tired considering our just past midnight departure time. So starting with the seat in the fully seated position, we slowly had to set up our bed for sleep using the buttons underneath the counter. First the preset gets us into the relax mode, which was very relaxing. The only problem being because I was sleeping or eating for most of the flight, I didn't really get to enjoy this mode for all that much. You can see here how there's no leg rest, but it does tip you back so you are sitting back in this bucket seat of sorts. Then you're close enough to the leg rest that you can just kick your feet up on that. I'm a little too tired for that though, so we're going to continue reclining until we get our fully lie flat bed. After a little while, it gets fully flat, almost completely matching up with the leg rest to make one continuous surface. With a couple lumps and bumps, it was a bummer not to have a mattress pad. However, we did have some other bedding we could set up, starting with the pillow. Took up most of the space for the headrest, and I, liking slightly firmer pillows, found this to be super comfortable. Then the blanket of a similar design. Like I said, it's not the thickest thing in the world, but it was pretty comfortable, and especially with no overhead air vents, I didn't need a whole lot to stay warm and cozy. 
All in all, it was a plenty comfortable bed and I had no problem sleeping on this flight. I do wish, however, the seat was a little bit softer or they offered maybe some mattress pads to artificially make it a little bit softer. Still though, plenty for a 9-8 hour flight. Now for the leg rest, we do know that it's plenty deep so most people won't have an issue even if you are pretty tall. That being said, it is somewhat tight, especially if you put things in that literature pocket, you don't have a ton of space either direction, and so you find yourself sleeping largely on your back so you have room for your toes. For those of you that do sleep on your sides, you end up finding your legs and feet pinned against the hard shell of that leg rest. Lastly, to get completely comfortable, we have the ambient light setting, which pretty much just lowers that light within the footwell. I will say privacy isn't exactly the best in these seats, as everyone at least has a partial view of you as you're sleeping. I'm so tired though, it doesn't matter, so I'm gonna get some sleep, and I'll see you guys when I wake up closer to Japan. I woke up actually to the first crack of light as we were approaching Japan, probably a little over two hours outside Narita. I did enjoy the lavatories, which were a pretty good size, but also fairly modern. You'll see the design of the door locks, the floor, and the sink are a pretty nice design. They did have limited amenities, admittedly, in here, but still better than nothing. But perhaps one of my favorite features that you see on these newer A330neos and A350s is the no-touch trash chutes. A little foot pedal you can use, press that and open up the trash chutes so that you don't have to touch that dirty trash door. Just outside the lavatory in the galley, they had a collection of snacks and drinks. I was going to go get my own, however the flight attendant insisted on helping me. Super gracious for that. I opted to go with some fruit and a nice juice considering we were about to get breakfast in a little over an hour. And as the sun began to rise over the Pacific Ocean, we were also handed out our arrival forms into Japan. An immigration and a customs form. At this point, the cabin lights were brought up pretty much all the way, we were handed out our hot towels, and they took our orders for our breakfast service. To start off with, I went with this little mango juice of sorts. They put it on the side counter, considering in the meantime, they put my placemat down for the breakfast. The breakfast choices were the cold plate, the continental breakfast, or the American breakfast. I chose the American breakfast, and of course, it was the most sugary of all the choices, with a salted butter caramel pancake. Delicious, but very sweet. It also came with a side of yogurt, granola, and fruit. I also chose to go with a nice cup of New Caledonian coffee, which came with some honey that I used to sweeten the coffee. Personally, I think that the snack service after departure was a little bit better than the breakfast service, but I do have to give them credit for that cup of coffee. It was a very good cup of coffee, and much needed. By the time they collected our breakfast, we were only about a half hour outside of Narita. I enjoyed that beautiful Air Callan A330 wingtip, and we made our descent into Japan. Before arrival, I just want to mention that my flight to Noumea was from Sydney on the same exact aircraft, but I flew in economy class. I just have to say that it is quite possibly one of the more comfortable economy seats that I flew in. You'll see that there was plenty of legroom at each seat. There was charging ports at each seat. There was also pretty much nobody on the airplane. I was able to move to a window seat as my flight from Sydney to New Caledonia was not even 50% full, even in economy class. So a great way to spend not even $300 to get to a very tropical destination. In addition, even though it was a fairly short flight, we were also given a full meal and beverage service. I found it to be a better meal than some of the US and European meals that you'll get in business class. As far as their future and their fleet, the fleet's not all that big with two Twin Otters, two A320neos, and two A330neos. Formerly, they had a very diverse fleet due to leasing aircraft until they were more established. Things like a single 737, a single Caravelle, a single 767, and a single A310. 
Then, once they were more established, we saw two A320COs and two A330COs, which were replaced with their current A320 and A330neos. This may change soon, however, as they've been deciding between adding one or two A350s or 787s, with plans to finally reach Paris as soon as 2026. There's about 60,000 passengers each year that travel between Paris and Noumea, using Air Callan and connecting with one of their partners in Singapore or Tokyo. Air Callan has never served Paris except for repatriation flights at the beginning of COVID, but non-stop from Noumea to Paris is a bit far, especially for a small airline, as the distance is comparable to the Sydney to London flights that are also a goal of the industry, but with much more demand. It sounds like Air Callan plans to serve Paris instead with a stopover in Bangkok or Sydney, as Seoul and Tokyo have been rumored to not be feasible due to the closure of Siberian routes. Due to the Air France co-chair, however, it sounds more and more like we'll see a Paris to Singapore to Noumea route. The current fleet wouldn't work for this as it's fully utilized, and this route, if flown at their goal of twice weekly, would require one to two new aircraft. It's also worth noting that this is not their first time planning this route, but this time seems to be carrying a bit more sustenance. This also would be the first time we saw a connection between Paris and Noumea, as previously we saw Air France service from Paris to Tokyo to Noumea with the 747 until 2003, as well as Air Astral planning a Réunion Sydney Noumea route, with passengers able to connect to Paris via the Réunion hub, making an easy connection, although long journey. The Air Astral plans never did come to fruition, and while it seems like an almost 0% chance, I always like to analyze the chances that we will see new airlines in the US as well. The only argument that I would see for this is that airlines like Air France, French B, and Air Tahiti Nui have seen great success in their routes from Tahiti to Paris via Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. So I wonder if Air Callan would ever look at a similar strategy to that. Regardless, even with a new CEO somewhat recently, it seems that Air Callan continues to follow the same growth path they were on, and I look forward to seeing what their new aircraft order and route plan will include. I'm back in Tokyo for the first time in 2024. Narita is an airport we visited a number of times in the last couple years, although this is the first time on Air Callan. And since we landed on 3-4 right but park at Terminal 1, we get the absolute pleasure of taxiing for what feels like two days. Flight timings are all a bit strange, departing at 1am for Singapore, Sydney, or Tokyo, although it makes more sense when you look at connections. I actually watched the Air France 777 land as we taxi into our gate, and due to the partnership, the timing allows passengers from Noumea on Air Callan to transit on Air France and continue all the way to Paris, and vice versa. Speaking of Air Callan, however, this may be the best value I have ever gotten out of a business class product. First off, the airport would have been great had I not arrived super early. That one is on me. Once stuff was opened, however, it was a lovely space with the gardens mixed in and the check-in and security being extremely efficient. Between that and the lack of items inside security, there's really no need to get to the airport all that early. The lounge was another great plus as well. It worked perfectly for their size, and as mentioned, it was one of the coziest airport spots I've seen. I kicked back for a couple hours, watched Ted Lasso while snacking, and I could have spent a full day in there, honestly. Once on board, I was loving the seats. Even though my seat had some stains, it was a great setup, and the odd-numbered seats do offer far better privacy. I found my feet to be a bit cramped at times, but if just sitting or laying normally, it was comfortable. 
I will add that from my first flight in the same aircraft, but in economy, I was super comfortable with plenty of recline to take a nice nap leaning against the window. There was a lack of normal American entertainment options, but since they don't fly to the Americas or Europe, I won't hold that against them. Maybe just bring something of your own if you'd like to watch more of that. Free Wi-Fi of any sorts is always appreciated, so even though it wasn't the full flight, I loved that they offered us 250 megabits. The food was okay. I didn't find the selection to be too great as dinner was just one default selection and the breakfast was a little weak, but it definitely wasn't bad per se. The crew was fine, all of the interactions I had with them were great, it's just that since it was a mostly nighttime flight, they remained out of the cabin to allow people to sleep, so I just had limited interaction with them. What absolutely sealed the deal for me was the price of it all. I paid a little over $600 for this flight. Let me be more specific, I paid $630 for this 9 hour, incredible business class flight on essentially a brand new aircraft. Just to compare, the cheapest non-Air Callan flight between Noumea and Tokyo and Arita had two stops, two airlines, and cost $650. So I paid less than that and got a non-stop business class flight. The word value doesn't even do it justice, robbery is more like it. For that price and quality, I would take this flight a hundred times over. That's my two cents though, share yours down in the comments below. And until next Sunday however, safe travels, I will see y'all next time.